Let's get started. So uh, once again, I'm, this is Rob Buchanan. I uh, work at Billion Oyster Project. I'm a community engagement manager, which means I work at uh, work in our various field stations. And I'm in Williamsburg right now uh, in a, a great storefront space. We hope that we can build out more of these. And one reason we wanna do that is because we're really excited about community science. And that's what today's event is about, uh, giving uh, community scientists um, and academic researchers at all levels a chance to explain their work and, and give uh, everybody else an opportunity to see what's happening in, in and around the harbor. Um, with me, um, thankfully, is my colleague, Mike Cohen, who is, um, is helping technically organize this. I'm sure this is the first time we've done this. I'm sure there are gonna be some technical glitches. So just bear with us and be patient. And um, I think we can make it work. So uh, as I said, we're, we're excited about community science. We've started, um, we've, we've basically taken an existing water quality testing program under our umbrella this year. Uh, but, and, and of course we've got our uh, ongoing oyster monitoring projects at, at all levels happening throughout the harbor. And we're, we're really keen to see what other people are doing and to form partnerships with them and, um, and keep this whole idea alive of crowdsourced knowledge about the harbor and the estuary being, um, being a, a great way to proceed in, in the restoration and regreening of, um, of our common space. So that's the point of today. And um, I want to ex explain, and Mike, you may have to jump in and help me, but the way that we want to try and do this is just have your, you give your presentation and um, move immediately on to the next one. I may ask a couple of questions if I think something needs, could be clarified or, or, or emphasized, uh, but generally speaking, we're going to, we're going to keep you all on mute. Um, and uh, if you have questions, you should put them in the chat. I think other people will be interested in hearing those questions and maybe helping to answer them. And presenters, um, try not to let get distracted by those questions, but, but after your presentation, you, you could answer them or you could wait till the end of the show when we'll throw open the, the microphone and people can speak and ask um, questions directly um, verbally. But I think it's the only way we're gonna get through all 14 um, of these presentations. Now, they're not gonna be long. Uh, with two exceptions, these are five minute, uh, the, the limit is five minutes. So I'll give you a warning at around four minutes and I'll start to, um, to you know, aggressively cut you off at five minutes. Um, but, uh, and, and, and there are a couple of longer ones. Um, one, the, basically our, our second presentation is gonna be a little bit longer. Um, it's about oyster larva distribution and, and tracking that. And the, our last presentation, which is about eelgrass and a long-term ongoing citizen science project is gonna be a little bit longer, but otherwise short, keep it short and sweet. And remember, you're not trying to, this is not a sci scientific conference. So it's, it's just, you are, you are um, explaining the basic outline of your program and getting other people interested. Um, and, and that's really, that's really, your job here, it's, it can be very casual. So with that, I'd like to open with um, somebody from Billion Oyster Project, a colleague, Tatiana Castro, who is gonna, gonna talk about uh, how our oysters are doing. This is a question we get all the time. How are our, our, we put a lot of oysters in the harbor and she's gonna tell you how many and how they're doing. So Tatiana, I think Mike is enabling you uh, to share your screen and turn your microphone on. So why don't you, when you're ready, go ahead and, and, you know, yeah, don't feel like you have to squeeze it all in. I'll give you a few extra seconds if you spill over. Thank you, Rob, and thank you, Mike, for hosting this. Um, so I'm going to jump right into it because I do have a little bit to cover, um, and I would like to be able to um, get through everything. So my name is Tatiana Castro. I am the Restoration Field Coordinator at the Billion Oyster Project, and uh, what I do is I ensure that we have all of the log logistics um, planned for oyster insulation and oyster monitoring, spring and fall monitoring uh, for our oysters. So the sites that um, 
these are some of the sites that are active at this moment. Uh, Basewater, Coney Island, um, you guys can see the list, but um, I would like to kind of move you guys over to this interactive map that I have or a map that I created um, that kind of just illustrates and gives you a, a bit of a bigger picture of where our sites are located um, looking at the map of New York. Um, so we have up here, um, you know, if I click on it, it says the name. We have Tappan Z Bridge. We have um, us deployed some oysters there um, and we've deployed uh, oysters uh, in various parts throughout New York. Um, and I don't want to spend too much time on this, so I'm going to go ahead and hop back into our presentation. Um, give me one second. I would like to move this bar here, but it's not letting me. Uh, here we go. Alrighty, and here we go again. So, um, I'm going to start off by I'm um, just talking about the community site, um, community reef sites. Uh, I will not be talking about nurseries today um, because, again, it's we're very um, time constrained um, during this presentation. So I'm just going to quickly run through um, some of the sites that we have oysters at. Um, last year, we installed uh, 96 bags at Bay's Water Point State Park. Um, it is a lovely site. It's you know it, it's it's great. Um, it's a bit hard to get to, so we have to make sure that we um, provide transportation for anyone who wants to come out with us. Um, there, we've installed approximately 525,000 fat, uh, fat on shell. And what that means is, you know, um, for those of you who might not be familiar, fat are just um, small um, oysters that um, cement or set on um, different substrates where there would be shell or um, rocks. And then from there, they start growing. So we've deployed approximately 525,000 spat at this site. Um, during our annual spring monitoring this year, which took place about two weeks ago, uh, we discovered that um, due to high wave activity and sediment suspension at this site, a lot of our bags were covered um, by anoxic sediment. And so the um, oysters that were buried under that sediment, unfortunately, um, did not make it. But the oysters that did um, manage to um, stay out of the sediment did um, survive and they were doing really well. So we will be going back in approximately three weeks to kind of um, you know, scope out the area once again and see what it is that we can do to um, hopefully be able to keep these um, oysters out of the sediment. Um, we also have Coney Island Creek. Um, in 2020, um, we went out to the site and confirmed that there were no live oysters there um, from the ones that we had installed the previous year. And so we um, deployed another 2,600 oysters into that site. And um, we came back this year uh, to monitor them once again and realized that there was um, mortality at this site. Um, and this could be due to different um, uh, things. You know, it could be uh, made, maybe boring sponges or oyster drills. When we went in the spring, we did see a lot of oyster drills at the site. Um, so I think those might be, um, you know, culprits for the high mortality at this site. But uh, we are hoping to be able to install two new cabinet reefs at this site um, in a couple of weeks. So stay tuned for more information regarding Coney Island Creek. Uh, Brooklyn Bridge Park is another one of our sites that we installed last summer. Um, we deployed 215,000 oysters um, in 30 SEPA cages at the site. Um, and during our spring monitoring this year, we found out that the oysters are loving the site. They are doing great. Um, they're really enjoying their time there. Um, we've uh, we found you know, that we were, we've been struggling with a bit of the, the, the structures a little bit, lifting them up um, onto the, uh, the dock. But that is something that we are also working towards improving this summer. Um, we are also hoping to install three new cabinet reefs at this site, which is a different structure um, at a different part of the, uh, of the park. Um, so also stay tuned for that. <laughs> Um, we have uh, our uh, oysters at Bush Terminal Park. Uh, we were able to access them this year to do our, oyster, uh, our spring monitoring event. And we um, found out that the oysters are doing very well to the point where they have created a reef of their own, you know, which is potentially what we want is for them to kind of grow the way that they would in, the, you know, in the natural environment without human interference. Um, and so they've grown out so much that they're intertwining with each other and we are unable to pull up the files or the bags. Um, so it makes it a little difficult to um, look at them and to monitor them, but it's definitely a good sign for us. Powder get basin. Um, we found a large amount of growing um, oysters um, 
but they, uh, there's also a big amount of boring sponges that we found at the site. Um, and so what the boring um, sponges do is that they make the shell so brittle that it breaks. And so it makes it hard for the oysters to survive. Uh, we also found a lot of oyster drill eggs, uh, but the oysters continue to grow and cement together. And once again, that is a good sign for us. We also were able to deploy in 2018 about 480,000 spat at this site. Governor's Island, um, right now there's not a lot going on there. Um, there's only about five trays of brew stock oysters. Uh, but the reason why there's not a lot going on is because we are preparing to um, create space for 2 million oysters that will be making their way to the EcoDoc for our ORS program. So that's very, very, very exciting news for us and for the, um, uh, the folks that are working on ORSs. Our okay, Tatiana, hold on one sec. I'm gonna, I have to, interject here now you're gonna i know these are the pri the big scale projects you want to talk about but you're gonna have to really flick through them quickly so we keep it rolling okay most definitely right. will do big scale, big scale projects we have head of bay um and we have we installed oysters there um back in 2017 we've gone back and the oysters are still doing well um E, we're gonna move past that. Tap and Z Bridge, one of our really big scale projects. Well, we were able to deploy uh, a large amount of oysters at the site, approximately 5.8 million live oysters. And um, they seem to be doing really, really well. And at Soundview, uh, we deployed approximately uh, um, 169 gabions. And altogether, we deployed 12 million oysters at this site. Um, if you guys have, um, any, you know, kind of, if you guys want to know more precise numbers, we covered about 12 acres so far. We've uh, approximately 1.6 million pounds of shell so far have been um, released into uh, the harbor and about uh, 15 um, oyster sites are, you know, total number of oyster sites uh, is what we have right now. How many oysters have we deployed total so far? 47 million oysters. Um, and we plan to install 20 million more this summer. So stay tuned for that. If you guys have any questions, my name is Tatiana Castro. Uh, this is my email address and thank you guys for your time. Great, thank you very much. And so short story, the short version of this is uh, we've got 47 million oysters in and we're hoping to get 20 million more this. So this is a really big summer coming up. Okay, yeah. that's great. Thanks very much. All right, so now we are um, going to move on to something that sounds uh, really interesting to us, to us oyster people. And I want to say that that we have a lot of oyster presentations today, but we've also got a lot of water quality presentations, and then a few kind of outliers um, scattered here and there. So um, we're going to move on to another presentation about oysters, and this is uh, from Sean Kramer, uh, and the title is "Oyster Babies in the Hudson: Where do they come from? Where do they go?" All right, Sean, go ahead. Thanks. Thanks uh, to Rob and everyone at the Billion Oyster Project for this opportunity. Try to keep this short here and give you a heads up on sort of this big project we're taking on. Can you see the slides now? If I scrolled over. Okay. Okay. So I we have a lot of um, cooperation with BOP, and I just wanted to show you a, a quick slide. I mean, I think actually uh, Christian dropped off of there. <laughs> because there's too many people. Um, but there's uh, a lot of folks at BOP that are interested in working with us and we are very uh, grateful. Um, I am a mathematician, applied mathematician at Norwich University and that's the only university I think up there that you may not be familiar with. Um, so I gave you a little map, um, central Vermont. And uh, we're developing a very large ecosystem model. And the point is to help inform folks that are interested in restoration like the BOP um, to see if we can sort of uh, ensure that, you know, we're, we're trying to optimize the efforts. Uh, and so we're de developing a transport model and a filtration services model. So if we plant a colony, where might that colony um, propagate or add, uh, you know, uh, through larvae, plant new colonies? Uh, do they all get flushed out? or are we going to continue to seed and, and replenish the population? And so that's the transport bit. And then also, if we plant the colony, how much uh, of, the, of the water in the estuary is going to be filtered by that colony, by a healthy colony? And so there's sort of two, two aspects there that we might be interested in. 
all in um, the hopes of cleaning up the water. And so uh, we also have to validate those models. And one of the big goals we have is to include online platforms that can be used for education. Um, because after you do all of this work, we'd like to be able to, to put the word out that you've done all of this work. And this is why it's important not to overfish and leave these things alone and keep the water healthy and ecosystem healthy. So um, I don't think I need to explain to you why this stuff matters because you're here. Um, but there are other reasons you might be interested uh, to know that you know, this is um, an interest, this is a, a topic that's gained an interest. So restoration has grown thanks to efforts like the, the Billion Oyster Project. And these are not cheap. So it's, it's time investment, it's, um, it's costly labor, education. So there's a, quite an investment that goes on when you work to restore these things. And um, we'd like to try to make sure that we're optimizing the, the work done. Uh, in terms of ecosystem services, so filtration and restoration. And um, we all know that oyster restoration, particularly in the Hudson River, can improve water quality. So this is a, a great goal. And um, the current efforts that are out there, uh, they basically, they have to ignore the, the complex hydrodynamics. So how does the water move about in the estuary? And so they sort of just ignore all of that because it's very difficult. So our goal is to, to make this much more accurate um, in terms of estimation and, and um, projection. So we're using the, I'm gonna call it NIHOPS, but it's just an acronym for the New York Harbor Observing and Product, uh, Prediction System. This is a three-dimensional model, so it has depth to it. So you're not just looking at the surface vectors and how the water moves around on the surface, but down below as well. And what we're going to do, the logic for this model is essentially, you know, um, generally to assume that we're going to place a hypothetical colony somewhere in the estuary. So let's put one there, right? And then uh, we're going to add contaminants, synthetic contaminants to the water, and we're going to begin the simulation. So how do the hydrodynamics move the contaminants around in the estuary? And at any given time, if you are um, a contaminant that is over an, an oyster colony, you're going to be filtered according to observed rates. So these rates are observed by researchers in the field. So they know roughly, given um, you know these scenarios, how will how rapidly will a colony be able to filter the water? And then, so at the end of your simulation time, you you get these result that's a filtration services, and we we might re represent it in terms of you know proportion of the estuary that's been filtered, or the the number we might get creative and say number of stadiums of volume of water that's filtered. So we can present it in terms of, I don't know what your favorite team is, but Philadelphia Eagles, right? So um, <laughs> yeah, I know I'm in Vermont, but all right. So uh, then you repeat. So you're gonna try somewhere else and, uh, and see if that one is better. So if we try putting a colony north or south or east or west, uh, let's just see. And we, we're gonna search for an optimal colony. So it's sort of an optimization search. And so this is just a really brief slide to show you, you know, mathematicians, we like to encode these ideas in the language of equations. And so um, this is how the equation might look that I'm actually solving in a software package like uh, MATLAB, which is a really nice package for doing simulations. And all that means is this rate of change equation. C is the concentration. And that's just a, a rate of change and how the concentration changes in time. That's the first term on the left. That e is equal to the next term is just that the bolded V is saying those are the, that's from NIHOPS. That's how the the um, the water currents are going to move the tracers around in the concentration of pollutants. So that's all that means. It's just a fancy looking uh, advection term. And then the plus F is a reaction term, and that says okay, so this is how the colony will react with the contaminants in the water, and it depends on things like the current contamination, so what is the levels currently, uh, salinity, temperature, the age of the oysters. Um, and so a lot of stuff goes into that, but that's what the, the equation looks like and that's what you get to solve. Um, so we, we've been funded for this work through New York Sea Grant, Norwich, and um, we get the data from Stevens Point. They're, they're the ones who have developed the NIHOPS model. That in itself is a multi-decades effort to, pres to provide an, a model that accurate, it's a very difficult problem. So we're, we're very grateful because this work wouldn't be, uh, 
it would be another decade delayed because I would have to do it. And so it's really hard work for them to do that. So we're grateful for the model. Um, so the web tools we're going to develop here um, are mostly for education. And then we, we would also like to provide a, a modeling tool that's a little bit more rigorous for uh, researchers um, and restoration managers so that they can say, I'd like to look at the Jamaica Bay and I wanna try to, you know, we're gonna try to, um, you know, see where the optimal position might be to, 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 uh, to, to, to quantify our efforts and see, see what we might be able to pull off here. So there's sort of two goals there. So I'm gonna show you um, first what our models look like. So can you see that now? Just to make sure that as I'm switching desktops, that works okay. So this is just a simulation of the Jamaica Bay and those are the contaminants. And so we might just be looking at how they move around in time. And so those are contaminants that have depth to them as well. So every contaminant, you're looking from above down, down at the Jamaica Bay and every green dot has several dots below it as well. It's very hard to visualize this in 3D without just blowing things up. So you have to just look from above and, I, and, and understand that there's depth to these as well. And so this is just the uh, transport services model. So we're looking at how uh, do passive tracers in the water get moved around by the currents. And so you can see this washing machine effect as the tide changes. That's a really difficult region. And it also happens, it happens in several parts of the estuary. So these are complex dynamics. And that's why this model is um, necessary to really get you know, accurate results in terms of residence times and how you know, effectively you know, um, an, an estuary might be filtered. So the next movie, which I don't quite have yet, is this movie. And on top of it, we're going to be showing you how they're, they're filtered out. So um, if I put a colony in the south region there, how would the uh, colors change? They'll go from green to blue as they get filtered. And so I actually have that movie, but it's so big that I didn't want to crash my computer to show you. So I'm still uh, compressing that stuff. These are very uh, <laughs> heavy data sets. So that's the movie. The vector field that informs that movie just looks like this. It moves in time. So you can see the, the, um, the tide changing. It's not in real time. That's very fast and sped up. So finally, I wanted to show you the um, website that we're building. Um, this is the website. It's going to be a little bit more, hopefully a little more fun than your typical website for modelers that could be very dry. Um, but the uh, one I'm working on right now. This isn't live yet. It should be live this summer. But I would like to have the uh, students have the abilities to say, OK, I'd like to look at the Hudson. So I'm going to scroll over here. Oh, I can look at that domain. Or I'd like to look at the Raritan Bay or Jamaica Bay. So I'm going to click on the Jamaica Bay. OK, so we're going to study the Jamaica Bay today. And we're going to put colonies. Where, where should we put colonies? And so oops, um, here are hypothetical colonies that you can place. And if I click on one of these, that's not finished yet. But what will pop up is a pie chart, essentially, that says, this is the proportion filtered if you put a colony there. This is the, right? And so that's what's going to happen in terms of the uh, educational component. And, um, and, and then we're going to have a little bit more rigorous component for researchers who want to actually define with maybe their cursor where they'd like to put a hypothetical colony. So for educational purposes, this is we wanted to lock down a few, you know, finite number of possibilities. So here are your finite number of possibilities for colonies. Um, and I wanted to make sure we have a page that we're going to fill in about the BOP and all of the excellent work you're doing. Um, and then we're going to have an education tab here, which we fill in with the biology, physiology, mathematics, we can statistics, we can load that up with all kinds of different fields because this is a really awesome opportunity for cross-disciplinary um, work. So, um, so that's where I'll leave it to make sure we don't go too late here, but that's sort of what we've been up to. Thanks a lot. And if you have any questions, uh, I didn't write my email down, but S-K-R-A-M-E-R at norwich.edu, I can put it in the chat. We will, great, if you would, that would be great. And we'll circulate a list of those afterwards, I hope. Um, so just one question, um, uh, Rob, would you ask Sean to clarify what he means by filter? We have some middle school students here, so it'd be great to hear 
what kinds of organisms benefit from oyster filtration? When you say filter, you, you're talking about oysters that would be removing these contaminants from the water. Is that what you mean? Correct. Yes. Yes. Bivalves that would plant. And, yeah. Yeah. Existing and, colonies. Yeah. So that so that piece of uh, video that you're talking about where the green dots turn to blue would be um, an easy way to see that it would. Yes. Yeah, okay. I really wanted to have that video for you, but it's so. But it's <laughs> um, it's funny, too powerful for the. Yeah. Computer. Okay. So you start out with green, and those are going to be the full pollutant concentrations. This is a really nasty, yucky green, mm -hmm. right? And as it gets filtered, you'll see in real time as it turn, it'll turn to blue, and sort of that's the uh, visualization tool we'd like to throw in on the website so students can see in real time how these things would be filtered, filtering water volumes. Right. Okay, well, thank you very much. It seems like uh, very ambitious to do both things at once. I mean, the educational side of it and the, the kind of um, prediction of where to actually do restoration, but um, fantastic. Thank you. Okay, let's um, uh, move on. So uh, Michael Mangello is our next uh, speaker. Mike, Michael, you're gonna talk, right? Or are you gonna, you are? I have a little poster that I'd like to share. Great. Okay. So um, the title of this is Oyster Drills Do Not Access Artificial Oyster Cages from Piling. So Michael, go ahead. Uh, hi. So I'm Michael, as you guys know. Um, what I did the past uh, year now during my sophomore year at SUNY Maritime, um, I've been, uh, well, let's, let me talk about how it all started. One day of uh, uh, Rob Crafta, the waterfront uh, leader at SUNY Maritime, he um, was inviting students down to come help out with his oysters that he has over there, um, that the Billion Oyster Project donated to him for the uh, site over at Maritime. So um, me and one of my uh, friends, um, Mike Canarian, who helped me on this project, um, we went down and while we were sorting through all the oysters, we noticed there was a huge uh, mortality of them, just dead. A lot of, lot of them are dead. And there's like, the, 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 this entire uh, pier was covered in oysters and still uh, the ratio of alive to dead oysters was we found more dead oysters than alive. So we came up with a theory as to how all these oysters are dying. And we determined that well, a lot of them were dying because of uh, oyster drills. And we're able to tell this because if you look at figure uh, two and eight, that, that's a picture of the oyster shell where you can see a perfect one millimeter sized hole that the oyster drills uh, drill into it. So we're able to identify that these oysters are dying due to oyster drills. So our theory was that these oyster drills are getting into these cages that are hanging uh, up against these piers by the pilings. They're climbing the pilings and getting inside the cages. So to determine this, we took down a team of um, scientists, civilian scientists and volunteers from our school, as well as um, that region in Throg's Neck. So people would come down and help us tally up how many oyster joes we found in the cages, how many alive oysters we found, how many dead oysters we found, and how many um, oysters that were killed by oyster drills. And we also measured the uh, distance from the cages to the pilings. What we found was really unique actually. We found that, uh, we found more oyster drills further away from the pilings than we did that were closer to the pilings, which does not support our theory. <laughs> but it's uh, interesting to think about, which shows that how oyster drills are not using the pilings to get up into these cages. And oyster drills, since they're uh, snail-like species, they don't swim. So it's, we're still kind of puzzled about how these oyster drills are able to get inside these cages that are suspended in the middle of the water column. So what we've been uh, doing a little bit more researching later on this year was that uh, we predict that um, that there are at least two different species of oyster drills that are targeting these cages. Again, if you look at figure two and eight, um, you'll notice how the holes that they, the imprint that they leave are 
they're different. One of them is a uh, beveled, which means it kind of like goes in at like an angle, while the um, other one goes in like straight down. You get to go right through. And so what we think is that one of these species might have a uh, planktonic larvae stage in which uh, it, it can swim around inside the water and that the oyster gels can just like settle down there inside the oyster cages. You can see in figure seven, actually down here, that's actually a photo of oyster drill eggs that we collected from these cages. So that was a pretty interesting find that we found. We're not 100% sure, so we're still doing more research. So if you come back, I'll probably come back later with more information. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thanks, Michael. That's great. And um, yeah, I just, just wanted to, if people, people who don't know Michael um, should know that he went to the Harbor School. He's a product of the Harbor School. Although I think your, your CTE was vessel operations, if I recall correctly. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Okay. 180. So, <laughs> it's funny. This is a great, um, a great paper that, that we love because we, we were always worried about oyster drills getting into our oysters and do and taking elaborate steps to get them from being in contact with the ground because we had the same thought they were somehow crawling their way into the cages. But you're suggesting it doesn't seem to be so and, and it might be a larval stage just like oyster larvae that are floating around and they alight and, and so solving this problem from the point of view of an oyster grower might be a lot more difficult than we think. Exactly. Uh, they, they, these oyster drills can live in these cages for generations. Uh, through our, a little bit of research I did online, uh, we found that oyster drills can live up to like 10, 12 years. So they can lay their eggs and that they could uh, hang out in these cages for quite a long time, just feasting on these oysters that we have living here. Wow. Okay, well, food for thought. Thank you very much, Michael, that's great. Um, and I'm just checking the chat to see if anybody else wants to, to throw a question in. And otherwise, I think we should keep rolling. So, and now I've lost my list of um, who's going next. Mike, do you wanna help me out there? Who's, who are you? Who are... Okay. Wanna... Hi everyone, I'm gonna share. Thank you, Rob, for inviting us. I'm gonna share our slides. Great, welcome. And my colleague, Kate, will take it away for the beginning. <laughs> Go ahead, Kate. Great, hi, yeah, thank you for inviting us. So I'm Kate Good. Um, my coworker, Tashavi Acosta and I are from John Jay College. And we've been doing research on pharmaceuticals in biofilms and water from the lower Hudson River. Um, so I don't know if I can move my slides to Xavier. Did you want to move ahead? Thank you. Okay, so just a little bit of background um, before we get into our research on our method methods. So we know that pharmaceuticals enter the aquatic environment through a variety of different pathways, all of which are um, relevant to New York City. So a major um, mode of um, transport for these pharmaceuticals is through sewer discharge or combined sewer overflows, also improper disposal of medication. So essentially flushing your medicine down the toilet instead of giving, getting rid of it properly, and also runoff from the urban or agriculture environment. And pharmaceuticals, pharmaceuticals are a concern because they're poorly degraded during the conventional wastewater treatment process. So they oftentimes end up in the environment. There have also been studies and we know that pharmaceuticals bioaccumulate within organisms and they also biomagnify across trophic levels. So Tashavi and I wanted to focus on biofilm. And when I say biofilm, the definition really is, biofilm is like a complex matrix of bacteria, um, protists, diatoms that live on solid surfaces in the water. But the like the layman's term would just, it's like the slime on rocks, essentially. If you're um, walking by the Hudson River and you see that some of the rocks are shiny and green, like that shiny green is the biofilm that we were interested in. And we focused on biofilm because it's at the base of the food web. And we really thought it could be a mode of transportation for the pharmaceuticals into these higher trophic levels. 
Um, we also saw that there were no published studies on pharmaceuticals and biofilms in the New York City area. And there are actually very few studies on pharmaceuticals and water in the New York City estuary. So Jashavi is now gonna to talk to you a little bit about our methods and some of our results. Hi, so with our both, with both of our types of samples, since we were collecting um, a solid sample with the biofilm and then with the water, our goal was to recover as much of our analytes um, as possible. So for the biofilm, we first did um, a kind of a freeze drying where we broke down the biofilm and then we did a homogenization of our biofilm and moved to um, solid phase extraction and then to an LC triple quad. Um, for the water, much simpler extraction procedure, cleanup was with by filtering and then acidifying and moving to SP. We can see this was the sampling map for our Lower Hudson River project, and we can see all the positives that we got. Um, the main um, <clears throat> difficulty we faced was the recovery with the biofilm. It was a very hard sample to clean up, and as such, we had to use it more for qualitative identification of the compounds we did find. But the water proved to be um, a very good matrix. So this is why we are focusing on the water for this uh, newer project. So we can see that our site six um, was positive for two different types of beta blockers that are very um, commonly prescribed in the New York area, as well as alprazolam, which is a very commonly prescribed benzodiazepine. We can see we had some positives for some opiates. So we had a, a oxycodone positive in our biofilm. And again, um, we can say positive because we had a limit of quantification, um, but we, can't re we couldn't really say with definitive how much oxycodone was actually in uh, the biofilm. We're just uh, qualitatively identi identifying it here. Same thing for sulfamethoxyl, which is an antibiotic, which was found in our biofilm sample from site um, two. And site one showed uh, water positive for, again, those beta blockers, alprazolam, as well as fluoxetine, which is just uh, Prozac. It's an antidepressant that is commonly used. Here are what the results look like, the analytical data from our LC. So you can see the top um, graph is of our water sample at 50 nanogram per liter. And then um, site six would be a positive case. So you can see that we have a Tylenol, Mesoprolol, and Alprazolam here positive. And then for the biofilm, here is our limit of quantification, which is one nanogram per gram. And an authentic case at site three showed positive for sulfamethoxyl. Okay, so um, the research that Tashabi just discussed was performed in uh, three different occasions in 2018. And so um, we're starting this research back up again, but this time we've decided to just really focus on the water. Another thing about our project was that we were really limited with the sites that we could access when we were um, sampling biofilm because we needed rocks of a size that we could easily take out of the river and we use a stiff bristled brush to scrape the surface of the rock. And there are many parts on the Hudson River that we couldn't access because we couldn't get rocks of that size. And also we used a bike, like a trailer hitch to a bike. So we're really excited that now we're part partnering with the Citizens Water Quality Testing Program because that allows us to greatly expand the frequency of our sampling and also the number of sampling um, locations. So now we have, because of all the volunteers, so, so the, C, uh, the Citizens Water Quality Testing volunteers along with their water for enterococcus um, bacteria. They're also collecting 250 milliliters of water for us at their sample site. So we have 18 different sample sites. We've expanded beyond just the Manhattan side of the Hudson River to include Hoboken and also the East, the East River. And we're also including, in addition to our 16 pharmaceuticals, 16 drugs of abuse in our new um, research project, including drugs like cocaine, amphetamines, fentanyl, MDMA. So we're interested to see if we can see those as opposed to, in addition to you know, prescription pharmaceutical medications. Um, because of our partnership, we're also going to be investigating if there's a relationship between enterococcus bacteria concentrations in the water and pharmaceutical concentrations. When we see a spike in bacteria count, do we see a similar spike in pharmaceuticals, which would um, indicate that CSOs were a primary mode of entry. 
So we're um, four weeks down with sample collection this summer. Uh, we're really excited to be working with you all. And um, we're gonna start analyzing our water samples later in the summer, early fall. So hopefully we'll have some more recent results for you guys next time. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I look forward to the neighborhood by neighborhood breakdown of pharmaceuticals versus drugs of abuse. I know journalists are gonna be clamoring for that. Um, okay, very cool. Um, and I, I don't see any questions in the chat, at least not to the general everyone address. So uh, let's move on. Gracie, I think you are up next. Yep, and I'm gonna share my screen. Let me just say another uh, Harbor School alum, Gracie Carter, who's now a, a graduate. Um, you're out of college, but just graduated from Bard College. Yes, I graduated and I started my master's program three days after I graduated, also at Bard. Great. Um, can everyone see my slides? Wonderful. So Bard does something a little bit differently and we have senior projects, kind of like the senior project I had in Marine Bio. Um, oh, wonderful. And I just finished my undergrad degree. So I'm like still super excited about all of that. My senior project was about fecal indicating bacteria. So E. coli, enterococcus, anything kind of poop related and Legionella pneumophila, which is a gram negative bacteria. It's non-sporing and it reproduces in amoebae. And I can go into the whole reproduction cycle if we have more time another time. Um, it's found in water and soil, uh, air conditioning units and like shower heads are really common places to find it. There have been several like really bad breakouts across the United States and it causes pneumonia like symptoms, which we are all very, very aware of that can be really devastating to bodies. Um, Legionella pneumophila and E. coli and other fecal indicating bacteria seem to be best friends because they all grow in amoebae. And so it's really easy to track fecal indicating bacteria. So that's why I just piggybacked the two of them to track them together. Um, and my entire project, no, oh, we're gonna go back. My entire project happened in Dutchess and Ulster County, which is upstate New York. So I was along the Hudson River, just a little bit further up. Um, I looked at 12 different sample sites and I'll get into that. My primary interest was in determining whether or not Legionella pneumophila could be detected because there isn't a lot of information about it in general, if there was a relationship between fecal indicating bacteria and if they were existing in the same environments and if different environments had different results for all, both of those things. I was also supposed to look at the community organization of like the bacteria and stuff, but due to injury, I didn't get time to. So my methods, I picked 11 different sites, five sites in Red Hook, three sites in Kingston and three sites at Bard College due to access and one is an estuary site, one is a constructed wetland site, and the other ones were puddles. And they were great, loved it. Um, after every day of sampling, I ended up doing 52 samples. After every day of sampling, I would do other tests for entero and coli alert. And then my Legionella samples, since they are, are harmful bacteria, I couldn't sample, I uh, couldn't catalog them at Bard. So I sent them off to Gregory Mullen and Aslan McBull at Queens College. And then my DNA samples were done by me and my professor, Gabriel Perone. So this is my favorite graph out of my entire project, which is like 56 pages long. So the top pink line, the New York State non-potable water actionable limit. So everything above that, you can't drink it in New York State. Anything above the red or purple line underneath it, apparently was having a thing with colors, you can't drink it in New York City. So as you can see, pretty much all of our sites, which they are street water sites, I wouldn't suggest drinking them anyway, but they are far above that limit. And all of them happen except for that one, which is a street site somewhere after September 19th, were wet during wet events. So I was sampling half the time during dry events and half the time during wet events, because we all know combined sewer overflow, there is a huge relationship between rain and poop and well, this just like proved it all over again for those of us who knew that. Um, it's not letting me click. Okay, so this breaks it down really easily. It looks at the three different kinds of fecal indicating bacteria I was looking at. That's the blue, the red, and the yellow. And then the green is Legionella pneumophila. The left side is dry and the right side is wet. And it more than doubles for all of those results during wet events. 
And these were just random puddles around Red Hook, the constructed wetland at Bard, which is supposed to be naturally filtering all of sorts of icky things. And in Kingston, it was at Kingston Roundout Beach, which is pretty clean considering. And I have more graphs, but we're not gonna get into them. So my conclusions were that there is a frequent presence of Legionella pneumophila in puddles of rainwater on asphalt roads, especially during wet weather. Bard's constructed wetland is not functioning as it should be, and there seems to be no filtering or storing of bacteria. They had some of the worst results that I'd seen. It was really gross and the water was pitch black. It looked like black mayo, which is alarming because everything else around it is really green and pretty. Um, puddles, while still microcosms of bacteria, didn't have the fecal counts I was expecting. Our largest, our highest fecal counts were still in the constructed wetlands, which totally blew my mind because puddles, you'd think that with all the things that are on like sidewalks and stuff, it would have higher fecal counts. Um, I didn't expect high fecal counts with our estuary sites just for dilution reasons. And the puddles were also diluted every time I did the test and it shows up. So you look at all the results under a black light and it just glows whether or not you have fecal indicating bacteria and it was really, really bright. It was alarming. Um, and there is a high, there's a significant relationship between Legionella pneumophila and E. coli. There's probably also a significant relationship between Enterococcus and Legionella pneumophila, but R got really weird with me with my statistics and I had to turn this in. Um, and these results present an indication of wet water contamination from street water discharge into biospells, tributaries, and river samples. And the relationship between Legionella and the environment needs to be addressed because harmful ex bacteria exists in public waterways and we need to be aware of that for public safety. And the last page is my really long board, poster board that I presented for my senior project and I'm all done. Thank you, Gracie. Wow, so I'm hearing um, some questions about constructed wetlands as uh, it, it's a little discouraging, but I think it's great. I mean, we've all accepted that that's a good thing and it's going to do this great job and maybe it doesn't always in the way we want them, perform the way we want them to. Wow. And, and I'll, I love the title, Don't Jump in Puddles. Okay. I, I, it might be a little late for me, but... Um, okay. I still do. It just, you just have to be aware. Right. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, all right, let's see. Cody, are you here? Arnie, are you ready to talk about another uh, contaminated waterway, Flushing Creek? Oh, yeah. Always ready. Okay. Um, mm. Oops, I'm on the last slide. Spoilers, don't look. Ah. Um, hi, can you hear me? It's working? Yes. Great. Um, my name is Cody Herman. Um, I'm an artist now. I used to be somebody that might think they wouldn't be an artist, but okay, now I am. Um, and yeah, I've done a lot of work around Flushing Creek for the past seven years, kind of a lot of it inspired by citizen science and the Citizens Water Quality Testing Program and the Billion Oyster Project, Oyster Research Stations and Eco Docs. Um, but that is to say that I have no metrics to offer you in this presentation, just a good time. No, no, no metrics. So sorry about that, I guess. That's why we put you right in the middle to keep people on their toes. Yeah, yeah. So I'm the wild card today, I think. Um, but anyway, yeah, I have been performing as somebody that loves their local waterfront um, for quite a few years now. Growing up in Flushing, I really had no idea Flushing Creek existed. Um, which is a tributary um, in Northeast Queens. So this is a picture of Flushing Creek. Um, and, you know, me trying to have a nice beach day um, with a citizen's water quality um, beach towel, which some of you may have seen before. Um, but yeah, it was really hard to kind of pretend everything was okay while I was out there performing these acts of passive recreation and to pretend that everything was normal. Um, it just started getting pretty difficult. It was too muddy, a lot of flooding. And, you know, there's so much combined sewage overflow. Um, I just, there was no place to sit, you know? Everything is just like so contaminated. Um, so I decided I'm gonna have to build a living dock or an eco dock um, just to really have a place for habitat for people as well as oysters and seagrass and things like that. Um, so this is 
some pictures of this wayward eco dock out in Flushing Creek. Um, Flushing Creek really, especially at the time that I built this, had no formal public access points. Um, now one waterfront access plan has been built. Um, but you know, it's one of those places where when you sit in the bench, you can't see the Flushing Creek at all. Um, so really this was an opportunity to just have a place to hang out and to kind of be there and you know, get some takeout in downtown Flushing and eat dumplings on the dock. Um, Cause there was no place else to go to enjoy the waterfront. Um, so this is another photo, it's two docks. It's 10 by 12 when you put them together, only accessible by boat. This is before I had any seagrass or any milk crates on it again, cause the priority was really creating habitat for people. Um, you know, barbecuing on it, having a good time on the waterfront. You know, it's really far to get to like the Williamsburg waterfront or like Astoria or LIC or all these nice waterfronts where you can kind of hang out um, from flushing. So really had to make the space myself. Um, and yeah, don't worry, I did get some seagrass and it's kind of a fun, interesting story. Um, this is in College Point and McNeil Park. Um, and DEP actually put in the storm drain that you can see on the um, upper left of the screen. Um, and it actually started killing a lot of the restored wetlands that were in that area. Um, so James Servino, who is a marine biologist um, and active in College Point, um, he kind of invited me to take some of the Spartina that's really like covered in a thick layer of plastic um, and save it from the storm drain that just has all this litter and trash and is killing all the grass um, and bring it to Flushing Creek instead. And James has this crazy project where he like electrifies his reef beds um, and his seagrass and it helps them grow more. So that's what these like funny little DNA things are, but definitely check out Dr. James Servino if you haven't already heard about his electrified um, reefs and restoration. Um, but yeah, I mean, the grass grows, it works. My friends looked hot in this picture, so I wanted to share it. I thought it's a good example of like, you know, hotties on the waterfront, um, even in one that's so inundated by sewage. Um, but yeah, it's been two seasons of having the seagrass um, and it keeps growing. Um, and then we got oysters from Billion Oyster Project. So there are also two um, ORSs hanging off the dock now. Um, and also this little milk crate full of oysters too. It's pretty shallow, so there aren't that many in there. Um, you guys probably know more about this than me. Um, on the right or, or on the left side, those two pictures on the left and in the middle, those are um, pretty mucky in the winter. It was like really hard to handle. Um, and this one on the right is kind of from a couple weeks ago. Looks a little cleaner, more oysters looked alive. Um, but it seems like we have a ton of like star tourniquet colonies on everything. There's like this funny little muscle, it looks like. That's not an oyster, right? This guy in the middle? Don't really know. I think you're right. Yeah, so that's fun. That's exciting. Um, and then, yeah, I was thinking they were all kind of dead and suffocated from the star tourniquets, but it seems like they're rocking. Um, and then, yeah, I've been seeing a lot of these little crabs too when I pull them up, which is exciting, I guess. I don't know. Um, and then there are some roots from the seagrass growing out into the water and I guess some algae with some little shrimpy guys hanging out around it. So, you know, definitely getting our habitat for both human and non-human species. Um, but also, Recently, I did a project with Tending the Edge, um, Culture Push, and Works on Water, where we wanted to engage um, candidates in this election um, Last minute. With, the, with the waterfront. Yeah, this is going to be chaotic. I didn't think I'd get this far. Um, but anyway, so this group sunk shore. We actually had them come out into the dock while we were paddling around these city council candidates into Flushing Creek. Um, and they have kind of this speculative performance of what the future waterfront may look like. Um, so they kind of used the Oyster Research Station as a prop for their performance, um, gave them little water quality testing jars that they put some samples into so we could pass them around to people in the boats. Um, you could get right up on the dock and look into the cages. Um, and then we also had these people, you know, talking about the future autonomous communities of Willits Point um, and what it might look like up the canals once the star tourniquets have taken over everything and all the oysters died and things like that. Um, so it was pretty fun to have this like literal stage um, out in Flushing Creek. Um, and yeah, it's been fun. That's all I got for you. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and, and I think, you know, you do have some metrics. You just need to count the people in those slides. And that's a metric. Definitely. You've got people to the waterfront. And especially if they're uh, thought leaders or elected officials or opinion makers, mm -hmm. I think that counts. 
Yeah, definitely. So we've had, um, you know, both the progressive candidates for city council in Flushing and Willits Point um, on the Flushing and Willits Point side of Flushing Creek come out um, and kind of some of like the evil developer ones as well, which was a very interesting tour around the waterfront with them. But yeah, totally, totally worked and the oysters are alive. So yay. Great. All right. Thank you, Cody. Next up, Hannah, you are up. All right. Hi. Hi, Rob. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Hannah. Can you mute? Yeah. Um, okay. Um, he talking to you about a compare our comparative oyster study, oyster growth study here in and sharing you some of our initial results. Sorry. It's, can you see my screen? I can, but I can't change it. Hang on a sec. Let me, let's, let's swap it out so I can get your presentation up here. All right, let's take, we'll take a one minute technical break here. Um, Thank you. Okay, so here you sit here, okay. and you tell me, and I'll have to advance your screen. Well, I, I, I think I stopped sharing my screen. Oh, you're viewing my screen still. Oh, okay. Hi. Thank you for bearing with us. Um, okay, next slide. Can you go ahead? All right, let me try. All right, so on the left here is a typical ORS cage or oyster research station. And these are key components of programming at the Billion Oyster Project. And while this one here is covered in mud, you can see that the cage is made of steel and has ceramic tiles. Okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> um, has ceramic tiles to create habitat and has bungee cords um, to hold it all together. Um, on the right is a typical set shell with, um, and many of our oyster set shells come from the citywide shell recycling program. Next slide. Okay, sorry about this. We, I'm gonna move on to the next, Mike. Let's just move on to the next presentation. And uh, we'll try and sort this out and come back. I don't know why Hannah's computer is unstable like that, but Ashley, are you ready to go? Could you go ahead and take over? I am ready to go. I'm sorry you guys are dealing with that, but I'm- happy. Wait, you're, hang on one sec. Mike's gotta, he's gotta turn you on, so. Oh, she's good to go. Can you hear me now? Cool. Okay. I'm happy to jump in. I'm ready to go. So let me share my now we're into this. Yeah. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Just okay. You should be good now. Yeah. Can everyone hear me? Are we, are we good to go? I think so. Yeah. Cool. Great. So um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Ashley Privet. I am a um, graduate student with the Wildlife 
Conservation Society, Bronx Zoo, which is um, accredited via um, Miami University of Ohio. I am also a uh, full-time staff at American Museum of Natural History in the Education Department. So I'm gonna be talking quickly about um, the Gowanus Canal, this lovely canal, and a bivalve survey that we're undertaking via underwater drone. That was actually a grant that the Gowanus Dredgers Canoe Club um, Cody, your project sounds super interesting, so I'd love to connect about that. Um, uh, got uh, the grant about this spring, and we have the drone in our hands, so we're working on that. As some of you know, um, there's a lot going on on the Gowanus Canal right now. Uh, so currently, the EPA funded dredging due to the designation of the EPA Superfund site uh, commenced in November. So if you were to visit the Gowanus, this is a lot of what you're seeing. You're seeing a lot of huge barges picking up that famous black mayo that is on the, uh, the, the floor of the canal, as well as large, large pieces of machinery that are floating up and down the canal uh, via the EPA. Um, unfortunately for the canoe club, the EPA has designated it unsafe to actually go canoeing on the canal while the dredging is occurring. It's a very frustrating and we're trying to go back and forth with working on them because that's a lot of the stewardship that we do and the education. But um, for right now, we're at a bit of a standstill on that. So um, we were granted this underwater drone uh, called the SOFAR Trident drone via the WCS grant that I mentioned. Um, right now it's under my direction and <laughs> um, I guess expertise or lack of a better word, um, lots of learning process here. And there are a couple goals of this grant using the drone that we're trying to accomplish with the canal. Um, so the main thing is to survey the extant ribbed mussels populations as well as oysters and their preferences within the bulkhead materials and configurations. So if, if folks do live in Brooklyn and you've seen recently, a lot of the bulkheads that were formerly wood very, very old, which are preferable for a lot of bivalves, is actually being exchanged out for steel. Um, and for those of you, of course, in the Billion Oyster Project know that steel is not very conducive to a steel and metal to a lot of bivalve growth and um, uh, substrate connection. So we're just surveying a lot of the bulkheads. Additionally, we want to document any coal tar evolution from polluted sediment beds. Um, I have a little snippet of a video here from our drone. This is a lot of times what we capture. I hope everyone can see sort of this <laughs> cloudy, um, for lack of a better term, coal tar um, as we lay on the sediment uh, on the floor of the canal there. Um, so that's a lot of times what we see. Oops, let me go back here. Um, as well as confirming the EPA bathymetry claims following dredging, we haven't been able to do that yet. Um, obviously, this uh, drone can actually be done above water. We don't have to be on the canal. We have about a hundred meter tether, so it allows us a lot of room to sort of explore. And we're also looking at hot spots for extremophiles, so, since we know that the Gowanus is um, very polluted, both by combined sewer overflow and historical pollution. We're interested to see if we can see anything. Um, on the floor of the canal. So this was actually our launch in a very cold day in the spring. Um, that's me on the left-hand side with some folks from the dredgers, uh, really learning how to drive this thing. <laughs> you actually have a remote control, almost like a video game controller. So it's very, very interesting. Um, and I took some stills. I'll show you a little clip if I have a, like 20 seconds, but here are some stills of some of those wooden bulkheads um, that we're seeing. This is actually along the Seventh Street Basin. If you're familiar with the canal, you can again you can see some mussels sort of within those cracks and crevices of the of the um, the wood bulkheads. Um, again, here are some that looks like an oyster. I think anyone <laughs> possibly on that right hand side. I think so. And I think here we have another one. So what we're doing with these surveys, and I'm going to just exit out of this for a second. Um, we're taking this footage, we're documenting where we are, um, taking pictures above 
uh, we're going forward, we're gonna take pictures of sort of where we are lo longitude and latitude to sort of know what direction we're facing. And a lot of times our footage looks like this. So we see a lot of, the water in this day was very clear. So we also have to plan that we don't go right after a rainstorm because otherwise we won't really be able to capture anything. You'll see a lot of these metal rebar which is sort of cool to see underwater because that's this is about so it's only 0.2 meters down um and you see a lot of algae you see a lot of um, mussels we've seen some different kind of worms which unfortunately go really quickly away from <laughs> from the from the drone uh, but this is a learning process for us and we're really excited this um this season, this summer, to really get the drone out this weekend, actually, if folks are around. We're going to be operating the drone from the 2nd Street Boathouse over on the, which is the Dredgers Canoe Club. Um, I'm going to be there, a lot of other folks as well, and we really are just excited to get people interested in the life that's within the canal, as well as um, just ensuring people that there actually is life in the canal. <laughs> it is not a dead zone, um, contrary to what a lot of people think. So that, yeah, that's my little spiel. Happy to answer any questions. I'll drop my email in the chat. I have, I know, I recognize a lot of BOP folks here. Rob, it's great to see you finally. Um, so yeah. Thank you very much. And likewise, and um, I, I think, you know, that, that last thing you said about it, just demonstrating that there is life in the canal is such a, and yeah, we know that, but to see it in color, like that is fantastic, so. I just uh, wanna also echo, um, I am available if anyone would love to check out some reef balls or anything with these, with this drone. It is super cool. I'm totally nerded out about it. I see Tatiana's hand up. Feel free to shoot me an email. I put my email in the chat. I'd love to connect. Great, okay, beautiful. All right, um, let's give uh, Hana one more shot at this and we're gonna do it from my computer. And I, so I'm gonna share my screen now. And I think this is what we wanna do. Okay, and Hannah, I'm gonna turn it over to you. So go ahead. All right, thank you, Rob. Yep, I just, yep, okay. So I will be talking to you about a comparative study of oyster growth in Northern Brooklyn and sharing our initial results. So on the left here is a typical oyster research station or ORS, which are key components of programming at the Billion Oyster Project. While this one here is covered in mud and living organisms, you can see that the cage is made of steel, has ceramic tiles to create habitat and is held together by bungee cords on the right is a typical set shell, and many of our set shells come from the citywide shell recycling program. Here is a map of permitted and active ORS sites. Currently, there are over 50 sites with ORSs installed around New York Harbor. For this study, however, we'll be focusing on these four sites in Northern Brooklyn. And from here on out, we will look at these sites and results in order from North to South. So starting with Bushwick Inlet, the important takeaways from this site is the cages are in a calm, protected water and is only accessible by boat. The cages here are heavily covered in tunicate growth and other organisms, as you can see on this oyster on the right. And this is the only site that we find shore shrimp, sea squirts, small crabs, and juvenile fish, such as blackfish, are also commonly found here. The next site we're looking at is North First. This is an exposed riverside site impacted heavily by currents. Here we find a lot of tunicate growth and mud on the ORS cages and the oysters. Scalet fish, amphipod, and sea squirts are commonly found here. And this year we also have a um, healthy population of baby mussels as you can see here in this photo. Next up is Domino Park. And under the esplanade at Domino Park lives our next ORS cages. This site is characterized by heavy wave action and little growth on the cages. Because these cages are directly in the park, they're often disturbed by the public. The last site here is Wallabout Channel. This site is protected and has calm water and is directly next to a combined sewer outfall or CSO. These cages are heavily covered in mud and are mostly covered in these worm casings. So how are we conducting this study? This is a two-year study and these cages are 
um, monitored every two months. They were installed either in June or July of 2020. So we we're coming up on its halfway mark. Um, every live oyster in these cages are measured to the nearest millimeter. And at each site, we both, we have, we have spat from both SUNY Maritime and Cornell. But for the purpose of time in this presentation, we're showing you just the results of oyster growth in the SUNY spat cages. So here you will see four very similar result graphs. The x-axis represents time with the leftmost, with the leftmost value starting last summer in either June or July, and the most recent oyster measurements are on the right. The y-axis is average size in millimeters, and the different colored bars correspond to different cages at each site. So this here are the results from Bushwick Inlet. Overall, the oysters in these cages doubled in size from approximately 30 millimeters last July to between 60 and 70 millimeters this April, which is an, in, which is an increase average of 110%. At North First here, you can see we lost a cage at the end of last summer, unfortunately, but with the remaining cage, we saw the oysters grow by about 50% with the average size in June of last year being 29.5 and the most recent measurements um, at 46 millimeters. This graph at Domino Park looks really similar to the previous two, but please note the Y axis. Last um, June, the average size of these oysters were 28 millimeters, and in May, the average size is only 30.8. So that means Domino Park oysters only saw an increase of 7% over the last 11 months of growth. Finally, in Wallabout Channel, the oysters started at an average of 28.4 and 30.2 millimeters respectively. And by this past April, they had grown to 54.7 and 47.2 millimeters. So there was an average increased growth of 74%. So coming in last place is Domino Park with a growth rate average growth rate of 7.15%. Next up is North First at 52%. Next highest growth is Wallabout with 74%. And then finally, we have Bushwick Inlet outgrowing everyone with an increased average of 110%. So I wanted to address some of the problems and challenges that have occurred throughout the study. First off, we've experienced vandalism and disturbances of cages at both North First Street and Domino Park. Second, due to the nature of Bushwick Inlet, it is only accessible via boat. And this becomes a problem when the Billion Oyster Project work boat is either under repair or there's a small craft advisory out on the harbor and we're not able to access these cages. And finally, I want to acknowledge human error. For example, slipper snails, which are very common in the harbor, look very similar to oysters if you're not careful. And some oysters grow flush against their set shell, which makes it very hard to measure accurately. So what are the next steps for this study? We have over 10 years of water quality data thanks to the Citizens Water Quality Testing Program. We want to incorporate, incorporate that data and compare our oyster growth, our oyster sites to our water quality sites and see if there's any correlation between the enterococcus data and oyster growth. We also want to obtain pH and dissolved oxygen measurements by installing pH loggers and dissolved oxygen loggers at some of our sites. And we want to expand the study by adding more cages to our existing sites and incorporating more ORS sites around the harbor to this growth study. Thank you for your time and attention and patience. <laughs> All you, Rob. Thanks, Anna, for rolling with the punches there that was um a really tough one and i'm glad we sorted it out uh and i have once again lost the list of speakers so mike you might have to step in here and help me scott is next okay scott are you ready go ahead and let's let's hear about hey, the persian gulf thanks can you hear me and see my presentation yes okay great so i'm gonna um just talk a little bit about how we can use qualitative historical data to understand the same environmental processes happening in the Persian Gulf or Japan or Gowanus for that matter. So in 2018, a scientific journal published an article 
about the dead zone in the Arabian Sea or oxygen minimum zone in the Arabian Sea and Gulf of Oman. And it sparked a bunch of headlines about how it's the world's largest dead zone, how there's almost no oxygen, it's anoxic, and there might not even be marine life in this body of water. But what these underwater drones confirmed, local residents had known for a while through two sort of morbid symptoms of dead zones. One of them was red tide, uh, which in Oman is called uh, caused by a phytoplankton dinoflagellate called Noctiluca scint scintillans. So, and that's on the left side of the screen, this sort of reddish brown water that you can see in Oman. And on the right hand side is a fish kill or a fish die off, which is often paired with red tides. Uh, and it's a tweet, this is a tweet also from 2018 from Oman in Northern Oman. And the author of the tweet is saying, there's a huge fish die off, what is the cause? Where did this happen? And the president of the Omani Fishermen's Association, which I'm a social scientist who studies Omani fishermen and works with Omani fishermen. Uh, the president of that association responded saying, it's al-mad al-ahmar, which means the red tide. But red tide as a concept, we didn't fully grasp uh, in the Anglophone world, or call it that, until about 19, mid 20th century, 1947, 1948, when Rachel Carson, the environmentalist, pictured left, and uh, Paul Galtzoff, who were working for the Fish and Wildlife Service, were tasked with investigating these reddish brown streaks in the water off of Florida and hundreds of thousands of dead fish that washed, washed up in Florida at the time. And they used this term red tide. But just a few decades before, in the late 1800s, in Japan, the pearl farmer, the oyster pearl farmer, Mikimoto, experienced this process. His oyster beds died off in the 1890s and early 1900s. And he hired some scientists to investigate why these pearl oysters were dying. And they used the term akashio in Japanese, which also means red tide. And they named a dinoflagellate after him uh, that was causing the death of his pearl oysters. Around the same time, early 1900s, oysters were the biggest industry in the Persian Gulf. Here pictured is an oyster of, um, it's not Crass Austria Virginica, it's um, Pinctata radiata, which is the sort of Eastern pearl oyster. Uh, and these oysters were dying off as well in the early 1900s. And the British colonial government in India was trying to investigate why they died off. Here's a document that's saying investigation into the alleged depletion of pearl banks. And in my review of these historical documents, hundreds of pages of historical documents, their investigation didn't answer with the problem of red tide. They pointed to overfishing and kind of paradoxically to local Arabs putting discarded shells back in the ocean, which we know from working with BOP that this is a good thing for reefs and can be a good thing for reefs. So the British government, British colonial government was wrong. But in looking at colonial travelogues and other documents from British fishery service in the Middle East and the Southern subcontinent, I found two other sort of glimpses of what might be causing a dead zone, even at this period. Of course, the dead zone has grown in recent years, but in the early 1900s, local travelers always remarked about sea sparkle, about bioluminescent waters off the coast of Oman in the UAE. Uh, talking about how it dazzles people every night and miles and miles of blue sea sparkle. And in Oman, the same dinoflagellate that causes red tide is bioluminescent at night, Noctiluca scintillans. So we have all of this evidence in colonial archives of this particular phytoplankton or algal bloom, it's not algae, it's phytoplankton, but this harmful bloom, we have evidence of its wide dispersion in the colonial period. And then instead of fish kills, almost every colonial observer in colonial archive talks about the abundance of fish in the Gulf of Oman and the abundance of fish in the Northwest Arabian Sea. And while this might also seem paradoxical, if we imagine fish as of course a mobile species, they're trying to escape low oxygen zones. And they do that a lot of times by coming up to the epipelagic zone, to the surface waters. And you know there are dozens and dozens of pages that talk about how Oman is an extraordinarily abundant place for fish and fish jump right into the boat. And the thing that I'd like to raise when this very, I don't know if 30 seconds left probably, is that this oyster die off, the writing about sea sparkle and the writing about the abundance of fish might signify a dead zone because in the present, some of the biggest dead zones in the Gulf of Oman off the coast of Peru are associated with really rich fisheries. So from the past into the present, we have this idea of 
a dead zone and finding ways to grasp it before we have the language to do so by looking at historical archives. So I won't take much more time, but that's it. Uh, thanks for listening. Thanks very much, Scott. I, I am very envious of your career uh, focus. Omani Fisherman, that sounds like some great field research opportunities. It, wow, very cool. Thank you. All right, so any questions for Scott, you know how you can reach him in the chat here. I, I wanna keep going though, because we're rapidly approaching the end of our appointed time. And I think what we'll have to do is just spill over into the, the extra half hour. I understand, of course, that people have to leave, but I'm really keen to hear the remaining presentation. So Siddhartha, if you're ready, let's just go ahead and we're gonna leap back across the globe from uh, the Arabian Sea to New York Harbor um, and talk about water quality. Thanks, Rob. Um, can everyone hear me? Yes. I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, can everyone see that? Great. Um, so I'll be going quick, pretty quickly through these slides, not verbally, but through the actual slides, because they, these are slides for a 15 minute presentation that I gave at the New England Estuarine Research Society. Um, so hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me here, Rob. Um, nice to see a lot of familiar names and faces. Um, my name is Siddhartha Hayes. I'm the Research and Aquaria Coordinator at Hudson River Parks River Project. And I will be talking about pathogen testing uh, that we do as part of the Citizen uh, Water Quality Testing Program, along with Rob, New York uh, Water Trail Association, and many, many dozens of others, um, and have been since 2011. So uh, for those unfamiliar with our site, Hudson River Park is a four mile long, 400 acre estuarine sanctuary and waterfront park on the west side of Manhattan from Chambers Street to 59th Street. And we have now six sites in the park coming online at various times over the years. I think we're in our ninth year, almost 10 of sampling uh, with the Citizens Water Quality Testing Program. And the point of, I, think, I guess this presentation is, is to highlight the effectiveness of community science uh, and the sheer robustness of the data sets that you can get when you leverage invested community members. Uh, Hudson River Park is not home to just enterococcus, however, we have a variety of organisms. Uh, this handsome fella is an oyster toadfish, which is one of our most commonly caught fish we catch in our fish ecology survey. Um, we've been catching a ton of lined seahorses this year, uh, which is really exciting. A lot of the males have been gravid with eggs, so they're coming in and reproducing, which is really exciting. And so we don't want to just know about the enterococcus for the people, although that is the main point, it is also to see how it is for the fish. And there are a lot of people in the park. There are a ton of people boating, recreating. Um, so we just want you know the up-to-date information that the Citizens Water Quality Testing Program can provide. I will not go over how CSOs work because I think we definitely all know that. Um, there are about 35 CSOs in the length of the park. Um, I'll skip over some of the stuff about the formation of the pro program, um, because really what I want to focus on is the people who make it possible. So we have about a dozen labs in the overall program. Um, and in 2019, we had over or just over 70 different sites throughout the five boroughs and some places in New Jersey, um, which so it's a huge spread. And, and these uh, sites were sampling weekly for 20 weeks and have been for many of them for years. Uh, we're up to nearly 10,000 samples and I haven't been counting this year, but maybe we're over now at this point. Uh, so just a sh huge number, a sheer uh, number, a huge number of samples uh, that you wouldn't be able to get unless you had dozens and dozens of volunteers who were invested and willing to wake up at six in the morning, scoop some water, and then bike it somewhere before heading off to work. Um, so just that is like really the key piece in, in this program. And you can see how we've, we've grown from 2012 to 2019, as I mentioned, um, all the way up to just over 75 sites in 2019. Coronavirus put a, a bit of a dent in our numbers, but we're working our way back. Um, we use the IDEX and Alert methodology. It's accessible, it's easy to read. Um, 
and it's also really cool looking. You get to shine a UV light at water in trays and it glows blue and then you count them. It feels very, uh, very science fiction-y. Um, and uh, this is from Rob, this first picture here is from, from Rob's current new location that they set up this year for processing. Um, so it's um, a really great process and procedure. And it provides weekly site-specific information for boaters and recreators to make a educated judgment on whether or not they should engage in, in primary or secondary recreation. Um, I won't spend too long talking about the data. Uh, what's really nice about all this data is it really lends itself to running stats on. You have so much data, you can run regressions, you can do different stuff, you can look at, oh, how often does it, is it safe to swim, or swim, uh, not swim. We try not to say that. For primary and secondary contact recreation. Um, <laughs> I People had to swim. Let's face it. I had to. I had to re-record this exact uh, presentation because I said swim two and a half. So I couldn't do that on the record. <laughs> um, but yes, people do. Uh, but a lot of great data to work with. Um, this is just reiterating the fact that yes, we can prove with our data, absolutely rain rainfall significantly causes an increase in enterococcus. Um, and again, the students and the community members are, are really the people who are, who are making this all come together. And what we're really excited about too, and I'll, I'll leave us with this, is uh, we are working currently with a human-centered design group called uh, Cantina, as well as uh, Wade, Dr. Wade McGillis from Columbia University to develop a dashboard um, similar to the RICOS network, uh, but a little more intuitive and readable for the general public um, that will hopefully go live in a couple of weeks and it will incorporate uh, data that uh, from enterococcus sampling that we sampled in a very, very high frequency over a 36 hour period to generate a, a model basically to estimate um, CSO contamination risk based on rainfall in real time. Uh, it's not an, you know, an exact prediction, but it hopefully will, will give us some uh, more, even higher time frequency um, Su suggestions for whether or not you should engage in recreation in the water. So keep your eyes peeled for that. And thank you so much. Wow, thank you, Siddhartha. I love that last image of the dashboard. And, and um, I've had a lot of discussion with, and I know you guys have been talking about that for a while, but it's great to see it moving along. And um, I hope to see it in, in real life soon. I think, I think it'd be a great thing. Yeah, we'll let everyone know when it's live. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So um, one slight change here. Um, uh, Bart and Kayla, who are going to go last, have to leave. So um, I'm going to bump them up a couple of slots, Jen, Ira, and Julia. So you're going to have to follow. I'm sorry about that, but um, I'm going to switch. So we're going to, we're going to, Mike, you're going to have to enable um, Bart and Kayla right now, and then we'll come back. And Jen, thank you for um, uh, being okay with that. Ira and Julia, I didn't have a chance to text you about that, but um, so let, we'll do, we'll do Barton Kale on eelgrass and then we'll come back and talk about um, water quality, oyster castles, and uh, the salty commons to wrap it up. And obviously we're going to go over time here. So yeah, uh, if you can stick around and if, if you got to go, you got to go and uh, we will follow up with everybody with um, a final report on all of this. Okay. So let's see. Mike, are you doing all right on the, the, uh, okay. okay. So Kayla and Bart, if you are there, you can take over. Hi. Hi. Um, is Bart unmuted? He's going to go. No, you're, you're good. I can hear you. Uh, how do we get on the screen here? Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, hi, I'm Bart Chezer. And for the last several years, I've been working on attempting to restore uh, eelgrass into New York Harbor. Eelgrass is uh, Zostera marina. And probably most people working in the harbor don't know anything about it for two reasons. One, it's subtitled. So like other plants uh, you see along the shore, Spartina alternaflora and Spartina patens, stick up through the water. 
Zostera is totally subtital. And the other re reason you don't see it, it isn't here. Uh, it used to be in the harbor. If you look at Manahatta by Sanderson, he shows large beds of uh, eelgrass along the shores of Manhattan. He didn't cover the other boroughs, but I'm sure it was there also. But over the decades, it hasn't been here in the harbor. If you go to Eastern Long Island, parts of New Jersey, Connecticut, and Massachusetts, there are still large beds of uh, eelgrass, but we've lost it here. And the reason we've lost it in the city, uh, I don't know that we totally know, but some reason, but some factors are definitely there. And probably the two most significant is that we've lost our shallows. So where we put in bulkheads and where we've done dredging, those are areas that eelgrass would be growing. And the other primary reason is probably pollution. Now, eelgrass requires a number of things to be successful. It grows, you know, it's a plant, so it needs light. So it grows in shallows. So generally it's growing in water that's between two and six feet deep. But again, it's subtital, you don't see it at the surface, but it needs the light. And in lots of areas within the harbor, we have uh, very large tidal exchanges. So in one area we're working in, um, in uh, Sunset Park, we have a six foot tidal change. So even if you have at low, low tide, eelgrass just under the surface at high tide, that's six feet below the surface. So you're getting at a point where you don't have sufficient light for it to grow. Also, the eelgrass have, requires a number of conditions to be successful. One is you need a clean, sandy bottom. You don't, need, you don't want high organics. You don't want the mayonnaise. You don't want a lot of uh, organic materials that's breaking down. So you need a clean, clean sandy bottom. Um, you don't want too heavy a load on nitrates and phosphates, though you know it's a plan, so it does require that, but you don't want it to be too heavy. You need pretty good oxygen, but surprisingly, most places, except the very most polluted, have sufficient oxygen. Um, and that's pretty, pretty much it. Uh, if you have those conditions, I believe you can restore eelgrass. So I've been involved in trying to test to see if I could grow eelgrass in the harbor. And the first locations I, well, let me go to a slide or two. Okay. This is what eelgrass looks like. It's a uh, you know, filamentous uh, plant. Those uh, blades can grow from two to six feet long. It has rhizomes, you can see in my hand there, that you know, uh, grow within the sand, the area. And basically these, uh, they grow by two methods. One by sending out rhizomes under the bottom and they spread over time fairly slowly, but they will over time if you have a good site. And the other way they can grow is they seed. And uh, I'll get to some of our experiments with seeding in a minute. And this is an underwater picture of what uh, eelgrass meadow might look like. And this is a very small area, but there are areas where you know tens of acres of eelgrass is present. Um, one, one thing I didn't mention and is obviously um, uh, critical is why, why eelgrass? I mean, looks nice and stuff, but you know why you want to grow it? And there's a lot of very good reasons to try to restore eelgrass, both hydrological, ecological, and environmentally. Hydrologically it basically stabilizes the sediment. These rhizomes basically uh, tie down the sediment. So when you have storms coming through, uh, heavy waves, basically it's protecting the bottom and it prevents the erosion that, uh, th that if you can prevent, uh, enables other organisms to inhabit that area. 
it's important um, because it absorbs nutrients. It, it's prolific in taking up nitrates and phosphates. And also it's you know a, a plant, so it's taking in CO2 and emitting oxygen. And there's been some studies where there are he heavy eelgrass beds and apparently a, an acre of eelgrass could consume much more oxygen than say an uh, acre of a forested area. So if you can reestablish eelgrass, you know, from a climate cha change standpoint, it be it's very important. And the last is biological. It's an excellent area for habitat, for spawning for fish, for spawning organisms, um, for you know, basically supporting biodiversity in the area. And one reason why there's actually money that goes into reestablishing eelgrass, it's critical to the uh, scallop industries. So in the Peconic where uh, there are fairly large eelgrass beds, but in some areas they're losing them, uh, without these eelgrass beds, the uh, scallop industry out there would not be successful. So it's very important in, in that context. Okay, so the area that I've focused most of my efforts for the last several years is a, a location called Pier 5 in Sunset Park, which is an old collapsed pier um, that's a thousand feet uh, long that extends from the shore. And what's kind of interesting for this particular pier is depending on the tides, either it's uh, mostly exposed or mostly under underwater. But what was important for me is that adjacent to this pier, there was a clean, clear sandy bottom that would look to be uh, good for uh, eelgrass restoration. Um, the bad news is it's, it's fairly narrow, long area along this pier. So ultimately, this is not a big area for eelgrass, but it's a good area in terms of testing whether we could be successful. Oh, this is kind of out of order. Bart, yeah, if you're, I don't know if you're trying to show slides, but we're just seeing one image here. So, which you're is the different slides? We're just seeing the first slide you showed, which is of, of the eelgrass. So, okay, let me, I don't know if you want to skip ahead or. Okay. Do you see that? Nope. We're just seeing, I'm just seeing the same thing. I, don't, I assume that's what other people are seeing. Yeah, that now we're seeing underwater. Okay, I'm sorry. I'll, so this is a bed of eelgrass uh, that you'd hope to establish. This this is Pier Five. Yep. On Sunset Park, where we're doing the work. And like I say, this is out of order. I'll come back to that in a second. Uh, maybe I won't. Uh, yeah, let me just show this. We've tried several methods for restoring the eelgrass in the harbor. One is by taking those shoots I showed earlier, weaving them into burlap, uh, pieces of burlap, and basically bu uh, bury them under the sediments with the hope that the rhizomes will extend over time. And they did to some extent, but basically after a year or two, we tended to lose the eelgrass. We also tried to hand, hand disperse seeds into the area, which is done in some of our restoration efforts we were also unsuccessful there, and that may have been due to the seeds not being viable. I'm not sure. What we have had some success with is, uh, uh, I don't see the slide, sorry. Okay. You can't see it too clearly, but I'm holding a net that has eelgrass in it that has seeds that are ready to disperse. And what we do is we put this in this netted area with a float and we anchor it to the bottom. And basically we leave it there for two weeks and it rotates in a circle with the tides, basically dropping the seeds over time. And we placed this two years ago off of Pier 5 uh, as an experiment to see if this would work. And the first year we basically saw very little seeds on uh, seedlings coming up from the bottom.
But last June, we returned to the site. Let's see if I get the right picture here. And basically, we had four to five feet lengths of eelgrass coming up. So it was exceedingly successful in seeding the area and establishing the eelgrass in this area. Now, I will have to say that over time, we seem to be losing the eelgrass for, for various reasons. We get a lot of epiphytes on the eelgrass. Uh, there are brant in the area, whether that feeds on some of the eelgrass, we're not sure. Uh, there's a lot of uh, snails that grow onto the, uh, that crawl onto the eelgrass and lay their eggs and kind of uh, flatten it down to the surface. So we're going to go back in the next <clears throat> month or so, excuse me, and see how this eelgrass is doing and whether it's established itself. But I guess what's most exciting is uh, this year we're also going to be working off of Com Conference, ha Conference House Park in Raritan Bay off of um, Southern Staten Island. And this is a great site because it has large flats with clean sandy areas. And if we could reestablish the eelgrass here, uh, you know, that would be an excellent opportunity for restoring eelgrass to the, uh, uh, to the harbor. And just two last slides. Uh, here you could see uh, the seahorse we saw last year in the area. And the last slide is we've seen many striped bass, blackfish, all sorts of other uh, fish, crabs in the area. So if it could be reestablished, it's in very important habitat, but we're still working on it and we'll see what we could do going forward. So with that, I'll turn it off to Kayla, over to Kayla to add some comments. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, so I I started doing research on, can you hear me? Can people hear me? Are you unmuted? Yeah, no, I can hear you. You're good. Oh, oh. Um, <clears throat> so I started researching um, eelgrass as a nature-based solution to climate change um, a couple of years ago now. Uh, I'm an artist, <laughs> first of all, um, and I started to want to incorporate um, environmental activism and climate activism into, into my art making practice. Um, and I had a certain frustration with the lack of, you know, making the climate solutions that we already have real. So through this research, I came across Bart's work. And I'm essentially uh, continuing the work where he is now. Um, he's helped me a lot with understanding um, what's going on in the city and um, with different partners and whatnot. So I'm basically looking for different sites at the moment that we could plant eelgrass in beyond where Bart has already planted. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, basically, I just... Uh, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm working with video, I'm working with performance, I'm doing all sorts of different stuff, but um, I would say that the main thing that I've been doing is site selection. So these are these are different sites that I've visited in terms of like looking for, for spots for eelgrass. And I'm very much trying to like make it not data driven or um, uh, let's say like unapplied science, um, but like hopefully create some kind of interface or, or video or um, installation or, or website where people can kind of get an understanding of like the physicality of what's needed to plant eelgrass. Um, so making visuals like looking at the NOAA charts, um, helping people understand how to read them because I didn't, um, and then like showing the actual images from the sites to show what you're looking for. Sandy bottom, um, certain clarity in the water, you know, not certain species, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm kind of building off of what Bart has already done. And hopefully we'll have um, an opportunity to plant eelgrass in August somewhere in the city. It may be at Bart's um, existing Staten Island site, but we'll see. So if people had spots they, they were interested in proposing to you, they should get in touch and you could start talking about whether or not they really are good candidates. Yeah, um, and or if they're just interested in, in planting eelgrass because um, I'm, I, have a, I have a grant and I want to um, 
share the wealth. <laughs> so instead of this, it's usually this kind of work is very heavily volunteer based, right? Um, not just with respect to eelgrass, but with respect to other species as well, um, other ecosystems. So I, I believe that we deserve and need a Green New Deal. <laughs> um, so the, that's the other part of the project is like making that real. So pay, I will pay people to help me plant eelgrass. <laughs> well, okay, that's a pretty good <laughs> offer. Yeah. Uh, yeah and, and the usual one too. Okay, that's, that's fantastic. And uh, I would just, I hope it's okay, but I just, we've got three more people who'd like to present. So I wanna keep moving. I know it's very late, um, but Thank you guys. I know in some ways your project, and I, I wanted you to go last because I think I think the eelgrass work is the kind of, you know, the the shining example of citizen science that's happened that, that I'm aware of um, in the harbor. And so I really salute you both for staying with it and making it happen. And uh, it's a great model for everybody else. Thank you, Rob. Jen, would you like to tell us about a brand new program on Staten Island that's pretty unusual in that it involves a high school. Well, I'm gonna let you talk about it. Yes, uh, I'm just trying to get my PowerPoint. All right, do you see the? I see it. Okay, perfect. Um, so I am Jen Friedberg. I am the science department chairperson at Monsignor Farrell High School. And I also run uh, the Marine Biology Society. We have 78 members. And during this pandemic year, we were trying to get students, you know, involved in different activities, um, have them learn about different things. Uh, Rob, you did the water quality with us. Uh, Andy Lederberg and Ann Fraioli came to the Living Breakwaters with us. So the students are really excited. They like to get out. Um, they've, they've gone and measured their oysters at the Oyster Research Station. Um, but we had a particular water quality Zoom with you and the students wanted to jump on board. So we tried to find out where the nearest lab was that we could bring our water quality uh, samples and there was none. So we went to our um, president of the school and he figured out that there's a DOE grant that allowed us to get enough sampling and equipment supplies for the next several years. Um, and we've got the Enter Alert system. So this is what the students saw. They saw the map and they said, how come there's no, you know, bullet points on Staten Island? We go to beaches here and this freaked them out a bit. So again, this is what made them jump on board. We ended up getting two machines. We have one refurbished and we have one new. Um, that way the students were able to learn how to use these um, this equipment. They learned how to take the samples. They learned not to put their hands in the sample after our first week of testing. Uh, the number came up quite high for MPN, uh, but it was because the, the boy said, oh, well, I put my hand inside to open it up. Um, so we obviously, uh, had to correct him on that. Um, but these are the locations that we currently are collecting water from. Um, it's based on proximity to the student's home. Um, they are freshmen that are doing this mostly in high school. So at least I have them for the next three years to continue with me doing this. Uh, we are hoping to expand it to additional sites. Uh, so just to get a closer look, this is Great Kills Park. Um, it's federal. So um, as far as you know what we can actually do there the kids just run go into the beach onto the water grab their sample come out and over here this one is oakwood beach uh this location we've actually been doing uh beach cleanups at so i'll, I'll show you that at the at the end so far um the data that we've collected at oakwood beach uh we've had 10 as our mpn for the two weeks that we've collected we're doing two trays because um we're taking the two sample bottles i'm running one and, and the students are running one. We want to compare to make sure that their methods are right, um, that everything's accurate. And as I found out the first week, May 27th, when I had a third sample run with one of the students, he, he had his hand inside. So that obviously contaminated our results. But so far, two weeks of results, pretty clean water. Um, Very, clean. And then, Very clean, yeah. Yeah, and the other, uh, the other group is going to Great Kills Beach. As I said, this is federal, not city. Uh, so... Still, it's close enough. There's the marina right nearby. A lot of people go to the beach here and and you know swim, sunbathe, uh, and we figured this would be a good location to check out as well. And from last week's data, uh, 20 and 10 were the results from the two trays that we had. We have 
uh, samples currently incubating. So we'll have more results tomorrow. Um, but these are our students. Uh, these are the boys that have been doing the water quality sampling. This is one of the beach cleanups that we had gone to. And in addition to just cleaning up the litter, we've actually had them collect data on what kind of litter we found. And um, you know, one of the students did a little uh, percentage statistics thing, and he said, "There's a lot of plastic ending up on the beach." Yes, that's the problem. It's um, you know, it, it photo degrades, and that's one of the things that we want to make sure that we're trying to clean up. So, I thought this would be just a nice way to end it, since we haven't really gotten a lot of data yet. Um, this was other data that we were collected collecting that kind of goes along with um, what we've been doing. So. That's Great. it so far. Uh, but because we have the two machines, um, the sealers, if anybody on Staten Island wants to bring samples to us, if they have a location they'll go to regularly, we'll definitely take it. We were trying to get Conference House Park, but a few of the students, um, they live close by, but not close enough that it would be easy for them to go in the morning before getting to school. So that was one of the reasons um, we didn't add that yet. That is that is one of the big challenges of water testing is the transport and the, the long distances involved. But that there is a lab on Staten Island now, your lab is fantastic yes. and that's a great offer. So I hope, I hope you get some people taking you up on that. Oh, I hope so too. <laughs> Well, thank you, Jen, and congratulations on that, on getting that off the ground. I think that's a, just a terrific accomplishment. So congrats. Okay, we, I, I don't even know if, if Ira and Julia are still here, but if they are, we're gonna hear, we've got two more people to hear from, and if you can stick around, great. Understood though, if you've got to take off. So, so do not worry. Um, Ira, do you wanna to talk to us about Oyster Castles? Are you there? I'm here, can you hear me? We can hear you, we can see you. Okay, uh, oyster castles. I had never heard about oyster castles until uh, December uh, when I went to uh, Swindler Cove. And I thought, let me, then I realized I wanted to make, build some myself. And I got a quote from the people who sell them. They're just in New Jersey anyway. So uh, this is what I don't have in mind. Something very expansive like this and all these red flags. Are here you showing are, us slides? Cause um, we're not, so, oh yeah. I'm you gotta sure share your screen. screen. You gotta share ah, your screen. Ah. That's, that's a key part of this. Let's see if you can get those to appear. Am I sharing? Wrong it screen. Looks like it's about to, yes. Well, I can see your, now we can see your uh, desktop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, shit. Looks like um, a coastal fortification. Let me bring this up again. Okay. You see this one, Lico? Yes, we got it. Okay. So, these red flags here are, they were doing a uh, plant, uh, they're putting in Spartina alternative flora and they want, they put the oyster castles in to protect the shoreline, but they actually found some, I found some oysters on them. That was a, a secondary thing. I'd also helped out with the Little Neck Bay oyster castles. This is also what I don't have in mind. This is a monster product project uh, set out in the mud in Little Neck Bay and uh, most people don't know what oyster castles are. I got a sample of five of them and they're about, they're like this, but these are really tiny. They're typically a foot on the side. And I wanna do this because all the oyster castle projects are not near where people walk around. So it's not part of anyone's vocabulary. I wanna demonstrate it to people who are just walking by. And here I have uh, some sites I presented at Community Boards uh, 7 and CB9 in West Holland Piers. This is a uh, transfer bridge site in the side south. This is the site in Cherry Wharf where I swim. This is uh, about 100th, 105th Street. You can see the traveling rings here up in the left corner. And let's see, this is the West Holland Piers South End site. This is the West Holland Piers North End site. These sites all have wild oysters and uh, rib mussels already. So they will be very successful. These are other places I'd like to put these things in. Right now I cannot because of parks. Parks has a rule. They put all applications on, permit applications on hold, pending what they happens with their little neck site. So they're being obstructionist. These are rib mussels I found at Cherry Walk where I swim. This was a surprise to me. These are at Riverside South. These are, this is an oyster Riverside South. 
this Trent Williams Transco Tires at West Harlem Piers what got me started with all this because I saw living oysters, wild oysters and rib mussels on the tires. And the dogma is, is that oysters like hard surfaces. I say, no, they like hardish surfaces. <laughs> anyway, this is a oysters and rib mussels on the north end of West Harlem Piers, actually not a great shot. Uh, this is the Swindler Cove oysters. Uh, this is a typical scene in Bayswater State Park. Pretty much oyster, uh, uh, rib mussels like to grow at the base of Spartiana alternaflora. This shot was taken, I think, in January sometime, so nothing's growing. This is a similar shot, but from Little Neck Bay. Same deal, base of uh, Spartina. And then I saw something about hydrogenerators. There's a, a city day of water coming up soon. And uh, I wanted to demonstrate water lily. It's kind of late, but uh, anyway, uh, why I've been following tidal energy for a while. And some of these items that you find, you can just buy off the shelf, but they're not cheap because they, they're intended for use on luxury boats. This is a picture of the water lily. It's kind of like a West German product uh, that uh, was on YouTube. And there's some links, and this is the end. That's it. <laughs> Great, thank you. So um, the oyster castle sites, are kind of you're talking about like a teaching garden or something that you could be in shallow water near where the public is passing by and you could- Exactly, yes. Yeah. Okay, and the wave, the wave generator would be a similar sort of a teaching opportunity, but not linked to the Oyster Castle thing. Absolutely nothing to do with it. Nothing okay. to do with it. You just had to throw it in because it's cool. Yes. yes. <laughs> no one knows about tidal energy. So. All right. I think it's great. I think, I think you should, I mean, I hope you get some Oyster Castle sites. That's a really long list of potential sites you have. And, well, uh, and it I might can, be. I can do, a, I can, I can do uh, I think, 250 castles for about, uh, $1,700 delivered. It's not expensive. So. Okay. Well, let's, let's, I, let's get one, one in there and see if you can keep going. That's great. Thank you. Welcome. All right. So, uh, Julia, if you are still here, you are now the uh, grand finale and, um, and, and a really different kind of a project. So I hope you are still here because it, it's um, a different approach to some of these same issues. So, Speak up if you're here and otherwise. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you, Rob. Um, thanks for inviting me. Thanks for having me as a, a last minute addition. I did not expect to be the last word as I am also one of the wild card projects in this mix. Um, I'm, I um, am Julia Noonan as of last week, as of Sunday, really. I am a Vassar College graduate in American studies. Um, still, still feeling very excited about that. Um, and I'm going to talk to you all briefly about my thesis, um, which is right here. Um, Great. And I'm just adapting my thesis presentation um, for you all, and I'll run through it really quickly. So my thesis is titled The Salty Commons, Oyster Farmers Forging Socio-Ecosystems on Land and Sea, and it focuses on women oyster farmers on the east end of Long Island. Um, and the essential idea here is that close study of Long Island oyster farmers has much to teach us about the good, bad, and ugly of our social and ecological interdependence. Um, and over the summer of 2020, I witnessed firsthand the ingenuity and hard work of commercial oyster farmers working to bring back the oyster and their once globally dominant industry. So quite a contrast from Billion Oyster Project as a nonprofit. Um, so whether in their first or 30th season, this new generation of oyster farmers establishes mutually beneficial working relationships and model empathetic and mindful relationships with nature. Um, oyster farmers and their practices offer an invaluable alternative to American hierarchical and ex extractive relationships with natural resources. So in like the play that is my thesis, um, the Peconic Bay is the stage and the center of the conflict. Um, I like to liken it to a damsel in distress that everybody fights over, but whose needs are ultimately ignored. Um, this map also includes other relevant players such as yacht clubs um, and the Shinnecock Indian Nation on the South Fork. The central conflict of my thesis is the Suffolk County County Aquaculture Lease Program's 10-year review, uh, where oyster farmers found themselves entangled in a centuries-old class conflict over both land and sea. 
And so as an American studies scholar, I ask how do disputes over this aquaculture lease program speak to a larger contested history over natural resources in Long Island and the US as a whole? And why is a working waterfront intrinsic to Long Island's sense of identity? And how do contemporary oyster farmers um, fit into the historical legacy of American relationships with the water? And how do they provide some amazing alternatives? Um, so I'm coming at this work um, as someone who, sorry, who um, I didn't grow up on Long Island, but um, my family has owned a house there for 30 years, so I didn't go to school there, um, but it's where I spent each summer of my growing up, West Robbins, Marks, uh, the Oyster Company, where I worked the previous summer and where I'll work again. Um, I'm also coming to this work as someone who has an uh, interest in terrestrial farming and outdoor education. Um, and so I'm so excited about oyster farming for the way it provides an alternative history and um, to the role of farming in America, uh, which we know is like deep rooted in colonialism and land grabbing. Um, or anyway, that's my liberal arts brain. Um, <laughs> so my findings here um, are re-understanding the Peconic Bay from a site of leisure to a place of work. Um, and so thinking about the identity of Long Island as, and this working waterfront and the characterization of the fishermen and the baymen as these romantic characters um, that are brought in to attract people for the, for, um, to spend the summers out there um, and to have this leisure culture of fishing and enjoyment. Um, but simultaneously, this trans, um, there, the rising cost of living makes it impossible for practitioners of this maritime culture to actually live there. Um, and this other um, idea that I'm working at, or my project as a writer, was to in, was to interweave this this historical working waterfront um, in Greenport, for example, um, with the observations and findings that came out of my interviews that I did with um, about five. Long Island oyster farmers, including Sarah, Mal Sarah Malinowski of Fisher's Island. Um, and so as you can see in these images that are flashing by, um, uh, is that I had a really good time um, just digging deep in the archive. And um, even as I wrote a thesis far away from the place that I was writing about, um, there's still so much richness and just like the deep rooted history of the oyster in New York um, provide so many delights and I'm incorporating my own photos that I took from working on a flepsy um, with images from my local library. Um, and I include this last image, this last modern headline screenshot, um, because it features three of the women oyster farmers that were my principal interviewees. Um, and so in writing about this social network that's, for, that's forming to um, create solutions and hubs of information um, and, and um, collaboration and resource sharing. Um, it was also so wonderful to have interviews and embed myself in the social network at the same time. Here's Julie Chu of the popular blog In a Half Shell. Um, yeah, and a big shout out to Pete Malinowski for also speaking with me during this project. Um, and I'll end with a small, um, <laughs> metaphor um, in that writing a thesis is very similar to standing at a tumbler, which I realize now that people at Billion Oyster Project probably don't do um, because your oysters all grow together. But for commercial oyster farm, farming growing, um, you stand at the tumbler with thousands and thousands of oysters. It seems like the work's going to be endless, but eventually everything gets sorted by size. Um, and it's quite a relief. And you end the day dirty, filthy, exhausted, but very satisfied and knowing you'll sleep well. Um, and so for that, thank you very much for listening to this quick overview. <laughs> thank you, that's great. And, and actually we do have a tumbler on the island that we use for, uh, for cleaning uh, restaurant shells before oh. we bag them to put them back. But you're right, our oysters do grow together in clumps. Um, and I, that's fantastic. I love that presentation. And also that you're going to be back out there this summer working again on, uh, on an oyster farm. And that, you know, that is, I, I think it is kind of an appropriate last presentation for today in that it, it does uh, introduce this thing that we really haven't talked about, which is the working waterfront and, and the idea that there used to be a great fishery in New York Harbor. And one of the things that we'd like to restore ultimately is a commercial fishery. 
that might be a very long way off, but you have to lay the base for it with, um, with the kinds of restoration things that we're experimenting with now. So that's great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we are, so we're way over time and we're past the end of our happy hour. And um, I'm, I'm perfectly willing to um, keep the Zoom going if anybody would like to stick around and chat. I know people have lives to lead. Um, so I'll just, Mike and I, Mike, Mike, I think he has to go to the prom, but I mean, not that he's taking a date or anything, but he's as faculty at the Harbor School, he has to be there. Um, so I think I can just keep running the Zoom for anybody who wants to stay or talk or, or, or um, ask anything or get put in touch with anybody, I'm here. And otherwise, thank you all very much for participating in this. I hope it was instructive and fun and that we got some ideas that we can put into practice um, as we continue in this crazy thing that we're doing, whatever it is, restoring the harbor. So that is it from my end. Anybody, would anybody like to, um, and how many people have we got left here? I can't quite tell. 24. 24, okay. Oh, hey, Pete, good to see you. Um, Mike, Mike unmuted me, so I feel like I should say something. <laughs> <laughs> I, think he's, I think he's unmuted everybody. I think everybody oh, is now unmuted. Technically, I unmuted, I unmuted everybody. Sorry, Pete. I thought I was special. Okay. Rob, this is really cool. Thank you so much for putting it together and really awesome hearing from everybody. All really cool work. And Julia, it's nice to see your face. Max was super into it also, right? <laughs> I can tell. Yeah. Thank you, Max. All right. Well, good. Unless anybody else wants to make a speech, why don't we wrap it up and, um, and get on with our lives? We will, Mike and I will talk. Um, I will send around uh, the presentations that I have been sent. I will collect and link and so forth. And I'll send around a kind of wrap up document to everybody with contact information for those who want to share it. And, um, and we can just leave it at that. And, and then I hope we can make this an annual thing. We might have auditions or some kind of, um, we might not try to present 14 projects next year, maybe a few fewer, I'm not sure yet, but um, any, any thoughts or feedback are welcome. And thanks again for coming everybody.